Okay, so we'll, we'll get started. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our live webinar, which is going to be presented by our guest speaker, Dr. Gerard Lambeau. Uh, it calls Novel Functions of SPLA2s, the Role of Inhibitors and PLA2 or 1. My name is Valerie O'Donnell. I'm based in Cardiff University in the UK. Um, we're going to have a webinar for about 45 minutes with about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, today's webinar is being sponsored by Cayman. We're very grateful for their ongoing support. So I'd now like to introduce Gerard. So Gerard Lambeau leads one of the world's leading groups focusing on secreted phospholipase A2 and their receptor PLA2 or 1. He's director of research at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique at CNRS and team leader at the Institute of Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology in Valbonne, the Sophia Antopolis, France. He graduated from University Côte d'Azur and received his PhD in biological sciences in 95 at that time discovering PLA2 or 1, which is a receptor for a family of secreted PLA2s. During the last 30 years, his research focused on the pathophysiological functions of PLA, SPLA2s and this receptor, highlighting them as therapeutic targets and biomarkers in diverse diseases ranging from cardiovascular to inflammatory diseases, cancer and infections. He's cloned and he's discovered and cloned several human SPLA2s as well, and over the years developed a large array of tools for research in this area. And during the last 10 years, he collaborated with nephrologists and identified pla 2 or one and THSD7A as two autoantigens in membranous nephropathy, which is a rare but severe autoimmunity, autoimmune kidney disease. I think a recent focus of, of his work, looking at publications, um, Gerard, are the interaction of SPLA2 with microbial organisms. Um, including SARS-CoV-2. This has also been a major focus of work, and I think you're going to be talking about some of this today, um, hopefully. Uh, in fact, just to, to say that it's been a great pleasure to collaborate with you in the last whatever year to look at the ability of SPLA2s to interact with the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. We have some data which we haven't even looked at yet um, regarding this, so we're looking forward to following that up. Um, Gerard has co-authored 165 publications and he's been the recipient of several awards and we're delighted to welcome him here today to present at our Lipid Maps webinar. So I'm going to hand over to you, um, Gerard, now. Okay. Thank you, Valérie, for the, the, the kind and, and kind of long introduction. Uh, it, it makes me thinking I'm very old nowadays. Um, so let's move on. So... Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this seminar and thank you, Cayman, for sponsoring this seminar. Uh, so th these are my conflict of interest with some patent and licensing issues. Uh, so the menu for today is kind of long menu. Uh, and so let's move on quick. And I, I wanted to, to make a summary of the, the milestone that just Valerie was talking about. And uh, I just want to highlight that uh, uh, the over title of the, my talk would have been this one, uh, from venom PLA2 to, to this rare kidney disease, uh, membranous nephropathy. I will touch this late uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I think it's important in science to have a chance to, to, to play with serendipity, and you probably know what is serendipity. Uh, I'm not comparing myself with Fleming, but uh, you may remember the famous story of Fleming discovering penicillin and uh, at the, at the small level of PLA2, this is what happened to me. Um, so basically, starting with venom PLA2, we identify a receptor that we call pla 2 r one We identify SPLA2s. We clone many of them. The idea is that, uh, is that uh, the, let me put the pointer this way. Uh, the idea is that these PLA2s are under the new slogan for this receptor. And, uh, and, and of course, since the last... 20 years or so, we are looking at the biological function of PLA2R and the PLA2s. And uh, we end up with some stories uh, related with clinical application. One of them is membranous nephropathy. And for PLA2s, there are many stories, but cardiovascular and sepsis is one of them, including maybe COVID-19. So I'm not sure who is going to attend this, this meeting. So I, I did uh, the ABCs of PLA2s, what I call the PLA2 maps, just like the lipid maps. Uh, and for this, nowadays, you can ask chat GPT, can you please help? And if you go to chat GPT, you will see this. Uh, uh, what are PLA2s? Basically, you have a, a chat GPT is quite good. And if you go to the end point, they just say that PLA2 is complex, multifunctional, with many roles in disease, and, and we need to dig for them for potential therapeutic application. Uh, 
We all know that PLA2 is a busy family of 30 genes uh, with many intracellular PLA2s. I'm not at all touching these PLA2s today. There's the lipoprotein PLA2, which is a secreted PLA2, but I'm not touching this one. And there are the S PLA2s, the one I'm going to touch. And all of these PLA2s do the same job. They hydrolyze phospholipid to make fatty acids and lysophospholipid, but in many different ways. And, uh, and, and the key question is always, what PLA2 do, what function in what cell, what tissue, et cetera? And we know that they play either a role in lipid remodeling or lipid metabolism and lipid signaling, of course. Uh, if you ask again, chat GPT, what's the main function? And then they end up with this, what I said, remodeling or acid, arachidonic acid release. And again, the complexity is there. Uh, you, you, you can do it yourself, the, the, the chat GPT questions. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, of course. And if you ask the, the difference between secreted and intracellular PLA2s, we go to the point that, of course, localization, location is important uh, for different roles in different cellular compartments and different physiological processes. So th this was the kind of ABCs of PLA2s. So now let me focus on SPLA2s. And I want to stress a few things, very important, because there are so many misleading messages in the literature for people who are not aware of PLA2, I want to make clear that you need to be very careful when you study PLA2s because there are many pitfalls. Uh, so some warning message. This is an example of free structure of S PLA2s. And you can look at the structure and you, they are very much the same. This is the active side, the hole where the phospholipid goes in, the hole where the PLA2 inhibitor goes in. But the blue, the, and, and these PLA2s are not equal. They are different. Uh, they are not functional isoform, just like cytokines or proteases. The one in the middle is the human group 2A PLA2, which is antibacterial, pro-inflammatory. We just showed that it has a role in microbiota. This one is a different PLA2. It looks the same, but it's completely different. And this one might be a target for COVID-19 and as an immune checkpoint. And this one is the one that can kill you from the, the snake, the Proteus duricis terrificus snake, but this one can also have pharmacological property just like in pain. Uh, so same structure, but very different functions. And, and so you can ask again, chat GPT, what's the difference between a venom and a, a mammalian PLA2? And if obviously you have many differences, one of them is the evolution. So that's why we, we asked 20 years ago, do we have many human PLA2 just like in venom, just like in snake venom, for instance? And in fact, the story of SPLA2 started a long time ago with venom PLA2. We knew as early as a century ago, roughly, that PLA2s are abundant, abundant in snake venom. So I'm not going to the details of this, but because of this diversity in, in venoms, we ask whether there are similar PLA2s in human. And that's why we end up 20 years ago with human as PLA2s, long time ago, long time ago. This is the, the, the days, the years, 20 years ago, where we cloned these PLA2s. I'm going to review a little bit this because again, there's confusion here. Uh, we can ask today the reverse. Can we go deeper on the diversity of snake PLA2 with the human enzymes? And yes, we can, thanks to the transcriptome, because the snakes, the transcriptome have been done for many snakes, the genome analysis has been done. The bottom line of this is that the snakes, they are just as smart as us. They express in their tissues the same PLA2 as we have. They also express PLA2R. So the snake has venom PLA2 plus tissue, body tissue PLA2s, what I call the body as PLA2s. And these are the autologs of our PLA2s. But the snake has venom PLA2, and as far as I know, we don't really have venom PLA2 in our body. Uh, so this is just because some people are playing with venom PLA2 and claiming that these venom PLA2 do the same thing as the, our body PLA2. Of course, this is a mistake. Uh, and I hate this kind of paper, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so if you look at the genomes, PLA2 are present everywhere, including plants, including fungi, including chicken, et cetera. And, uh, and the structure is pretty much the same. Of course, they, they are very different in the details, but the overall structure is the same. And long time ago, we did a review where we have the what I call the common core 
of every PLA2, basically the active site, but the remaining part of the protein is viable, and this explains the diversity of, venom of PLA2s in general. Uh, let me move on for this, the evolution. So probably, this is speculative, probably from the evolution, evolutionary point of view, we have a digestive PLA2, an enzyme that play a role in lipid metabolism. But then we have evolution in the snake in particular with some toxic PLA2s and some physiological or physiopathological PLA2s. And there are mechanisms at the gene level which are kind of crazy, but I'm not going into details of that. Uh, so let me now move on the mammalian PLA2s. They are not functional isoforms. This is really something I want to stress and there was again many, many, many mistakes 20 years ago in the field, which was making the field very messy. Uh, 12 genes for PLA2s expressed, don't look at the details. The PLA2s are expressed in different tissues, just like, just like of course, they are expressed from different genes with different promoters, and they are expressed in many different tissues. And they are regulated, obviously, differentially regulated. And the key enzyme is the group 2A the one that was targeted by farmers for years and years. But this PLA2 is kind of strange. This PLA2 is very abundant in our gut, very abundant. It's present in our tears and it plays an antibacterial role in the tears. This PLA2 also plays a role in microbiota. And this is a paper in the early days actually on, on the microbiota story. And the key point is that in the C57 black six mice, this PLA2 is naturally knockout, which is a mess. We, you can ask why this is knockout. But the point is that most studies done with knockout mice for different genes have been done in a background where this PLA2 is not present. And this is an overlooked story. This, is, this, this means that most people looking at different phenotypes, they play with an artificial mice a mice where there's no group 2A PLA2, which is very important for many, many things. So there's a major drawback here uh, for people outside the PLA2 field. So you can ask why we have so many SPLA2s outside our cells. And of course, the answer is very obvious to me. It's because we have many substrate outside the cell. We can think about the cell, the, the diversity of the plasma membrane when the cell gets activated, when the cells start to secrete microparticles and the exosomes, when we have lipoprotein in our blood, when we have lipid from the lung surfactant, and of course, when we have my, uh, microorganisms like viruses or bacteria invading us, these are substrate for PLA2s. So we have a diversity of substrate for PLA2s, and we need specificity of each PLA2 towards these different substrates. This is the basic, again, on the, on the SPLA2s. The SPLA2 can be active also inside the cell by some crazy mechanism and Makoto Murakami and us have been working on that for years, long time ago, in fact. Uh, so, so now, of course, what's the function of these PLA2s? Can we go to, to fear wrapping? And this is the point I, I'm going to touch mostly today. So the key guys making the job in the early days was Makoto Murakami, Kei Yamamoto, my friend, Michael Gelb, and, and myself helping everybody. Uh, and of course, I'm not forgetting Eric Voila, a newcomer somehow, he was a postdoc in my lab 15 years, almost 20 years ago, and I'm not sure he's listening to this talk, but of course, Eric is one of the promising guy, uh, pr probably replacing me uh, in a few years. Um, so, with Mako, and we did many reviews, Mako Murakami, we did many papers and reviews on different areas, and I'm not touching any of these areas except a few ones. Uh, but what I want to touch is the clinical trials and the messy part here. Uh, with the knowledge of the function of the different PLA2, we came to this concept. Some SPLA2s can be pro-inflammatory, while some other PLA2s can be anti-inflammatory. And this is just the parallel that you can do with cytokines. Some cytokines are pro-inflammatory, some other are anti-inflammatory. And you can guess that if you inhibit all of these enzymes together, there might be a mess. And this is what happened actually. So we have some 
what I call the good pilatus, the one you don't want to inhibit, and some bad pilatus, the one you want to inhibit, but maybe specifically. And the mechanism is messy because these enzymes may work as an enzyme by producing lipid mediators, for instance, but they may also work independently of the catalytic activity. And we clone one pilatu, which is fully inactive because of a, a point mutation in the active site. So you have to be open mind and think that the PLA2 may work independently of the PLA2 activity, which is not uh, studied very much so far. So let me touch the therapeutic target story. Where are we? Where we go? Uh, again, you can ask chat GPT. And actually, the chat GPT is quite smart and, uh, and very, uh, very democratic, I would say, uh, not, you know, not making a, a mess. So it says here, for instance, that the development of specific and selective inhibitors has proven challenging. I'm going to touch this. Uh, and, and we need further research to identify isoform specific inhibitor, which is what I'm going to touch. Uh, so to go back to the history of PLA2 inhibitor, uh, it's been 30 years ago that Lily, in particular, Lily started to work on inhibitors for PLA2s. And the best known inhibitor is called Varesplady PLA2 inhibitor for vascular disease. Uh, and, and this inhibitor actually failed in clinical trials so far. So let me just summarize this. So years ago, okay, more than 30 years ago, the story was a successful story. Cloning of the group 2A PLA2, structure of the group 2A PLA2, the first potent inhibitor, the grandfather of the varesplatib molecule, nature structural biology. And then they enter into clinical trials. They, these are being reviewed many times. Uh, we have 12 genes for PLA2 nowadays, but when Lily started, we just knew the group 2A PLA2. We didn't knew, Lily didn't know that there are many PLA2. They were not guilty in that case, in that case. And many companies were working on developing PLA2 inhibitor, not only Lily, but also Smith Klein Bisham in that days, Bristol Myers Squeeze, uh, Squib, et cetera. Many companies were looking at PLA2 inhibitor. Uh, the end up for the clinical trial is this one. So they enter into, into phase two clinical trial for sepsis, two trial, and no, no, no improvement for patients. Rheumatoid arthritis, no improvement. Asthma, no improvement. Cardiovascular disease, four phase two, one phase three, and then they end up the phase three in the middle of the bridge because there was higher mortality of pa for patients, which is really what they didn't want, of course, but this is what happened. And I'm just going to show you here, the, the, the patient treated with placebo versus varesplatib, and it's very obvious, there's more cardiovascular event for the treated group, which was, an early stop of the clinical trial, the same for myocardial infarction. This was a disaster, and this was 10 years ago. After this year, everybody, everything stopped. And now you can ask, why? What was the problem? Today, it's easy to say. The problem was that the virus pladib is not a human group 2A specific inhibitor. It's an inhibitor that inhibits many human pilators, making the mess, as I tried to say before, because if you inhibit all the SPLA2s together, the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory, you're going to make a mess. And this is what happened in the clinical trials. So we need a highly specific inhibitor. That's the point. This is very important. And can we do it by active site inhibitor? I, there are many papers, but I think it will be very hard. And I think we need to go on antibodies, targeting every PLA2 and being highly specific. Uh, we have the example that we published recently for the group 1B PLA2 in a, in a fancy story that is, a, that is CD4 energy. I, I invite you to read the paper and we identify antibodies that target the PLA2 and that are inhibitory. Uh, uh, I'll let you go to the paper. We identify antibodies that block the PLA2 activities with very high affinities, as you can expect for a high aff affinity antibody. We can dream this for the other PLA2s. And there are recent papers uh, on the group 2D PLA2, on the group 2A PLA2 in the microbiota, on the group 10 PLA2 in cancer. These are just a few examples from Makoto Murakami, myself, 
and, and uh, Eric Boala, for instance. But there are many more papers. And, and with that says, you want to inhibit specifically each of these PLE2s in some environment by developing inhibitors. And we need to go in this. We need to go to the specificity of this inhibitor, to the development. And this is a long way to go, but that's the only way to go, I think. Uh, if you look at the literature, look here. When the, when the, the, the PLE2 field was promising before 2000, and then the number of publications per day, per year, sorry, was going down, probably because of the clinical trial and the bad news of the clinical trial, especially in this area and, and, and nowadays here. Uh, still, can we dream something for the, the current virus Pradib inhibitor? Can we repurpose this drug? And in fact, during the pandemic, there was two trial. Let me explain. So even before that, long time ago, this paper was ignored, but we were the first about 20 years ago to say that, in fact, the varesplatib analog, the methyl indoxam, can inhibit venom PLA2. Not only the human or the mouse PLA2, but also the venom one. We published this. And in fact, we published, uh, this is even more complex, but I'm skipping this. Uh, in fact, the, the World Health Organization said uh, about 10 years ago that snake bite and venomation is a neglected tropical disease and we need a cure. And the cure may come from virus predict. This is a paper published by Matt Lewin in, in the US uh, and the company of Matt Lewin is Ophirex. And they, they, they develop a clinical trial. They are entering in clinical trial using virus predict to try to treat snake venom and venomation. And this is another paper from a, a UK group. Uh, Valerie, you may know Nicola Casewell. Um, so can we dream something for viruses um, and, and virus plenty? And of course, this was the time of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, years ago, long time ago, we had a drink, and this can work with beer or even orange juice. We had the idea long time ago, we published this paper in 99, more than 20 years ago. We had the idea to test the effect of venom PLA2 on HIV infection. And we published this paper showing that the PLA2 can block virus entry. This is for HIV, long time ago. Later on, the human group 10 PLA2 was showing to do the same job as the venom PLA2, meaning that Maybe we have in our body some human PLA2s that can fight, that can help us to fight against HIV. Uh, we, we made a review uh, two years ago uh, just to summarize what we know about venom PLA2s acting on different viruses. This is not specific for HIV. And the mechanism is kind of complex and I'm not going into details of this. The same is true with human PLA2s. You can have you can have uh, the, the, the same mechanism, either direct or indirect for, for PLA2s, even for adenoviruses without any lipids on the surface of the virus. So it's kind of complex. This is just to remind you that we have also an indirect effect on CD4 energy with the 1B PLA2. What about coronavirus? Same thing, you can dream this. Uh, we were scooped in this story. This is a paper from a, a Russian group uh, showing that snake venom PLA2 in vitro can inhibit uh, infection by SARS-CoV-2. This was published uh, two years ago now. Uh, but what about in vivo? Is it, is it the same in vivo as in vitro? And maybe not. Um, here we had an uh, old paper about 10 years ago now showing that for influenza infection, the group 10 PLA2 in our body, this is in the mice, but we can dream the same for us, the, the, the knockout survives better than the wild type to infection uh, by influenza virus, suggesting that this group 10 PLA2 is not good for us. We want to inhibit this PLA2. And the same is true for the group 2D PLA2 in this paper, now for coronavirus uh, virus. So in vitro, in vivo, we may want to inhibit some of these PLA2s and not stimulate the action of these PLA2s the opposite of the in vitro studies. And this has been published more recently by Stanley Perlman for the group 2D PLA2. We have a busy story on the antigen presentation with the group 2D PLA2 expressed in dendritic cells 
and playing a role in the antiviral response. I don't want to go into details, but if you are interested, you can go in these papers, just published quite recently. So here, we, this is about the group 2D PLA. And now you can, you can have many questions. Can we repurpose varesplatib in this setting? And actually there's a clinical trial on again, here, which is called STAIRS, again by Ophirex and Matt Lewin, just a second trial with varesplatib. Will it work? I just don't know. Uh, I would say no, but let's see. Uh, so beside the, the role of PLA2 in physiopathology, there's also the idea that the SPLA2 can be a biomarker of inflammatory diseases. And it started a long time ago with cardiovascular disease. This is the first paper more than 20 years ago showing that the SPLA2-2A can be a biomarker for cardiovascular disease. And we piled up on this and we had, there are on the market nowadays, some kits to measure the group 2A PLA2 in, in, uh, in, in, in cardiovascular disease, but probably also in sepsis because the group 2A PLA2 is also biomarker good or bad for sepsis. We published a paper years ago on, uh, in 205 showing here, this is an example on 33 patients where the range the, of PLA2 can vary depending on the patients and you can ask why some patients have a high level over patient as a low level, and is it a good biomarker? There are many papers on this. For COVID-19, we also have this data, which were unpublished because of the, of, the, of, the, of the difficulty to publish these results efficiently, but this paper from Floyd Chilton, and, and you know these guys, probably some expert on the PLE2 field, and they published the GCI paper showing the same thing as us. The level of PLE2 activity or the, the mass of the enzyme increase in severe patient and increase even more in, in uh, related with the mortality uh, of COVID-19. So with that said, let me, let me go on the, on the membranous nephropathy, the kind of cherry on the cake compared to all of what I said. So membranous nephropathy. Uh, again, the story started a long time ago from Venom PLA2, now to PLA2R1. Uh, to make a long story short, what is PLA2R1? We discovered this receptor as a receptor for Venom PLA2. And eventually we found that some mammalian PLA2s binds to this receptor, but this is a complex, a complex business. I'm not going into the details of this. You can ask questions if you want. It turns out that PLA2R is a kind of crazy protein. It's a C-type lectin protein belonging to a super family of C-type lectins. It belongs more precisely to the Manos receptor family. And the Manos receptor is a crazy protein as well. Uh, what's the function of PLA2R? Basically, I don't know. It, it's a receptor that binds PLA2, but it also binds collagen, sugars, and probably something else. This is not very well known. It exists as a membrane form, just like this one, but it also exists as a soluble form with, with shedding, with cleavage here. Uh, and, and the receptor, a lot of been, has been said on the role of the receptor in controlling the enzymatic activity of SPLA2s, playing a role in clearance, or maybe in signaling. Here again, there are many messy papers many messy papers and i invite you to be very very accurate to criticize these papers because again there are many bad papers i'm sorry for that and uh, and we found also that the receptor might be a gene suppressor playing a role in cellular senescence and cancer but we don't know the mechanism we don't know if the spl2 is important to the to, as a binder of the receptor in this mechanism it could be the receptor play a role without the contribution of the PLA2. There's no obvious signaling of the receptor. So this is a black box. And last but not least, when we clone the receptor in human, we found the receptor expressed in the kidney. This is our human kidney. Look at this, a huge expression in the human kidney in the normal situation, but almost no receptor in our tissues. Of course, this is the, the, the genuine Western blood, uh, Northern blood, sorry, 
that we published in 95. Of course, if you go to the database today, you have a better view on this. But the bottom line is always this. In our body, PLA2R is mostly in the kidney. And I cannot tell you what's the function of PLA2R in our kidney, in the normal way. But it turned out that PLA2R is the major antigen in membranous nephropathy. And there are many questions around. So I was very happy with this because, because it's like, you know, Eureka, you know the game, okay? So sometimes serendipity is there again. Um, so PLA2R is, is in the kidney. What is membranous nephropathy? It's a rare disease. In France, you have about a thousand new cases per year, new cases. But when you have the disease, it's not rare for you. It's a common cause of nephrotic syndrome, which means high proteinuria. There's no specific treatment. There's a viable clinical outcome. And before we knew PLA2R, we knew it's an autoimmune disease with antibodies circulating and killing the kidney podocyte. The podocyte are the key cells that filter our blood and make them uh, and, and to remove the, 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 the bad things in our blood, to, to filter the kidney, the, 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 the blood, sorry. And membranous nephropathy was an orphan disease before we identified PLA2R in 209 as the major autoantigen of the disease. We then identify another protein, which is called THS, D7A, uh, an, an orphan protein by itself. Uh, and and this was this discovery were a game changer for nephrology, for membranous nephropathy in particular. Uh, nowadays, there are kits to measure the level of, the, to detect the anti pd 2 r antibody in the blood of patients. This is very important for diagnosis, prognosis, and so on. And the same is true for the over target. And I'm not going to, to, to give you a lot of details here, but this is just a snapshot to show you that when the patient has a high level of antibody in the blood, the patient is sick. When the level of antibody decrease, the patient is in remission. If the antibody goes up again, the patient is relapsing. Uh, if you treat the patient, uh, if you, you can predict the, the outcome. If the patient has a high titer, this is bad news for the patient. You need to treat the patient immediately. If there's a low titer or my titer, you, you can wait and see. Uh, and if you give immunosuppressors to the patient, you can look at the titer of the antibody here. And if the titer decreases, it means that the therapy you're giving to the patient is working. And, and this, this drop is preceding the proteinuria drop. So you know immediately the treatment is good before you know the kidney function will recover. This is very important for the, the nephrologist. Uh, so this is what I just said. And uh, so PLA2R was there was basically no publication on PLA2R before we identified PLA2R in membranous nephropathy. But this is a way to show you the impact of PLA2R for nephrology. All of these papers are papers in nephrology. Uh, the same was true for THS D7A. Nobody knew THS. I don't know what is the function of THS, but this is the, this is the highlight of, of, of membranous nephropathy for THS. And the vice versa, we have the same story, but I'm skipping this one. So uh, what time is it now? 35. Okay, I have time. Not bad. So what to conclude? This is uh, Nice. Nice area. If you want to go to Nice, you can have this beach. Sorry, no sand. Uh, let's make a brief. Uh, this was also the movie festival. Okay, you may know this old movie with uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, Jane, 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 Jane Seberg, uh, all movie. So just to refresh what I try to say, the, the take home messages, I want you to remember that SPLA2s are not equal. They look the same. The active site is conserved. You can put the same inhibitor in the active site, with, of course, with different affinities, but they are not functional as a form. One can kill you, one can save you, and this one you want to inhibit because, because it might be not good for your body when you get infected with, with SARS-CoV-2, for instance. So we need very specific inhibitor, that's the point. And the reason is because some PLA2s are pro-inflammatory, some others are anti-inflammatory. And again, I repeat myself, we have some good PLA2s and bad PLA2s by some crazy mechanism. And the bottom line is that we don't want to repeat was what, what was done with Varesplady. 
we want highly specific inhibitors for every PLA2, for each PLA2. That's the only way to go back to, to the, the SPLA2 as therapeutic target, in my opinion, at least. Uh, so what's next? And again, you can ask chat GPT. And uh, I'm not going to read this. You can play yourself with this. So if you ask chat GPT, what do we know about PLA2 inhibitor? It gives you some information, which is kind of good, but it highlights the challenges and the limitation. And again, we need we need to be specific. This is what is basically said here. We need to look at the PK pharmacokinetics. There are very there are some problems with the virus pladib inhibitor in terms of pharmacokinetics, which is not very much highlighted uh, in, in reviews and papers. Uh, this is this is very specific. The inhibitor are still promising drugs, but we need to make them efficient and working to make it short. What is the best inhibitor? You can ask this question. But again, ChatGPT will say that it depends. To make it simple, it depends on what you want to do. And uh, and what's the future? And the future is obvious. It's promising. Look here. But again, we need selectivity. We need to discover new inhibitor. What I'm calling the second generation inhibitor. We need to go very specific. Otherwise, we are going to kill the field definitely. It's like if you inhibit all the cytokines together, it's not going to work. If you inhibit all the tyrosine kinase receptor together, it's not going to work. If you inhibit all the proteases together, it's not going to work. So it was kind of silly to try to inhibit all the PLA2s together. And this is what was done by Mystic, I would say. So we don't want to repeat this. Careful. We need, I'm sorry, PLA2 story is complex. This is a busy business. We need expert in the field and we need to go with highly specific inhibitor. Otherwise we kill the field, definitely. And this is related with the classification of PLA2s. Should we reclassify the PLA2? Every newcomer in the PLA2 area is just lost with the number of PLA2s, the classification of the PLA2s. This is really messy. So we need to reclassify. And with this, you can use the button in ChatGPT, which is re regenerate response if you're not happy with that. But you need some expertise to define the, is it a good response or not. And if you if you regenerate this kind of question, you, you go to this, this end point that we need a comprehensive classification, but this is going to be a, a long way to go. And we need to talk, to, the, all the experts talk together to have a more final uh, classification. I think this is essential for, for people working on PLA2, otherwise we go again and again on messy papers. Membranous nephropathy. When we identify PLA2 R1, now more than 10 years ago, it was the first antigen. Today, look at that. This is only 20. We have 20 antigens for membranous nephropathy. And we are going to reclassify the disease, but this is not a lipid story kind of busy, but this is really a hot topic for people working on membranous nephropathy. And the, the big picture is this one. Can we dream SPLA2 therapy? And as I showed you, starting with venom PLA2 up to the mammalian PLA2s. And this is a picture I took in Athens like 10 years ago uh, on, on the temple of Asclepius. Who is Asclepius? You may ask Asclepius, this is this guy. And you may remember that the MDs, the rod of the MDs, as a snake. And the pharmacist, the ball of the pharmacist, as a snake. And you can ask to yourself why there was a snake. Why this? And if you Google this, you would see that it's kind of bizarre. But the idea is that the pharmacy or pharmacon is a mixture of drugs, poison, and medicine together. And this is exactly the yin and the yang of the SPLAs. For the young people listening to my talk, I want to, to tell them, be confident with what you are doing and play with chance, serendipity and opportunities. Work hard, dream big, just dream. Science is a dream and never give up. Sometimes you will find something important and just go on an expected road. You may ask to yourself, should I do this experiment? And I would say, if you believe you, if you, your gut feeling is do it, yes, do it and you will discover something, work hard. 
So these are the people who's working in my team uh, over the, the last few years. And, uh, and uh, thank you, thanks, of course, to all of them. Some of them are still in the lab. Some are left at the lab, alumni. Uh, this is the meeting that we did a year ago in, in Nice, Saint Jean Capira, and I want to, to thank Valerie for coming again. Takao Shimizu, Makoto Murakami, Takeshi Arayama, Eric Boila, and of course my 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 best my my brother in science, Michael Gelb. Um, the next meeting this year will be in Paris. I invite you to register to this meeting, and uh, and I like to thank all the people uh, contributing. Uh, to, to what I tried to show you, I'd like to thank Chat GPT, which at the end of the day is a good guy on the replies. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you want to visit Nice, just tell me and I can organize a meeting and uh, you will land at this airport and I can invite you to Soka. If you have money, you can go to the Negresco, which is in the top 100 uh, hotel in the world. And thank you again for your attention. Valerie, I'm done. Thank you, Gerard. Yeah, that was that was um, brilliant. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions, so we'll go straight to them. So the first one up was Matt Conroy, and then Ed, ask your question. Go ahead. Uh, that was a great uh, exposition of the complexity of the family of enzymes. When you looked at the antibody inhib inhibition, do you know how the antibody stops the enzyme functioning? Is it blocking the active site or somehow taking the PLA2 out by some other means? Yeah, of course, that's a, that's, a, that's a very, very important question. So of course, of course, you can have antibodies targeting the PLA2 straight to the active site, and these will be inhibitory antibodies. We have the proof for that. We, we, we did a crystal structure of such an antibody. But of that course, you can have- That was my next question. Are there any co-complex, co-crystal structures? So, so we did this for at least one antibody targeting the pancreatic human group 1B PLA2. This is in the GCI paper. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you can have antibodies that target, I would say, the back of the PLA2, elsewhere, far away from the active site. And this antibody, of course, it does not inhibit the PLA2. We have the proof of that. Uh, but this antibody can somehow play a role in the clearance of the PLA2, it can change the location. So, so as you know, the antibodies are cleared and it might be the complex is cleared. Uh, so there are many options there. And of course, the antibody will be very specific of this PLA2. So the, the data we have published and, unpub and non-published shows that the antibody is highly specific for, for an isoform of PLA2, 1B over 2A, for instance. And even across species, the antibody is specific, which is a drawback in a way. But, but I invite you to be very careful when you look at the paper where they use an antibody because there are some mess here again. Sorry for that. Including in, in strong paper, in nature paper, uh, there are some mess. Some people are using antibodies against PLA2s, claiming it works. I want the proof. I don't believe this paper. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of very, maybe you, you, you may feel I'm nasty, but I'm not. I'm serious. Oh, it's always good to be skeptical. Um, the call at least, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ed, you should be able to unmute yourself now and ask your question. You are a beautiful, comprehensive lecture as always. Uh, so much information and uh, precision. I'm very impressed. Um, I uh, I was going to ask you if you were going to now have GPT write your papers since it did <laughs> such a good job, but I suspect that the the success of GPT in this case was uh, a result of the exact precision of the questions that you kept asking. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, so I had, first of all, I had, thank you very much for, for, for being there. Sorry, I may, I may have missed your question. What's, what's the question about chat GPT, sorry? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have a follow-up question, but my question was, I said the success of the GPT in explaining the phospholipase A2 field and its challenges for the future uh, uh, probably indicated the uh, cleverness of the questions that you asked it as you went yes. along, as opposed to from, uh, shall I say, virtually creating uh, this whole description of the field. 
Is that is that is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, of course we. I mean, I mean, as you know, you and me, we are we are experts in this field, including others. But uh, we need to make this field as clear as possible to avoid again and again papers uh, with some crazy stories. Uh, you and me, we know that there are there are papers in uh, in uh, in top journals uh, with with misleading uh, misleading information, and I think it's very important to 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 stop this. Otherwise, we are going to kill the field because everybody would say PLA two is doing everything, but at the end of the day, we do, we don't know we don't know what happens with these PLA twos, and we don't know about the inhibitors and so on. And the farmers will not play around because they don't want to waste money on. On a, on a target they, they they don't understand so to so, be more specific uh that was just a lead-in um uh, you made a point about the snakes uh leading to the evolution to humans which is 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 very sensible uh the the uh one enzyme pla2 you didn't discuss a lot is 1b which is the pancreatic and I would contend that the pancreatic PLA2 is the closest in some sense to the snake venom ones, both cobra and rattlesnake, closer to cobra. Uh, also, the, the, the snake venom of uh, rattlesnake and cobra are the stablest, highest specific activity, much higher specific activity than the other human ones. But the pancreatic human one is like the snake venom ones. And so yes. that that is an argument for the evolution that started with what a snake venom PLA2 does, which is just digest phospholipids. And that's what our digestive enzyme does very efficiently. Um, and when uh, Ed Mihalich at Lilly made the indole the drug you emphasize is the best ever made in the world and the most specific and the low uh the greatest uh uh or 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 lowest ic50 which is all true that drug was designed to not inhibit the human pancreatic enzyme so That's while true. as you pointed out it it inhibits all the other ones virtually it it's very specific against uh, not not to inhibit the human digestive ones so um where where what's why is that so different from all of these others yeah a lot of points in what you said um from the from the evolution evolutionary point of view i mean i mean there's the big picture and then there's the details the big picture is that the origin of all PLA2s in all uh, species, I would say, not only the snake and the, and the humans, uh, is a gut origin. The PLA2 were probably important for the two main functions in the gut. The, the function number one is digestion. We need to digest lipids, including phospholipids. But we also need to clear micro microorganism, pathogenic organism that might be present in the food. Think it the wild, okay? So we need a PLA2 that can kill microorganisms. And this is including bacteria and microbiota. So the origin of the evolution from the very far, we know, it's a PLA2 that has two functions, digestion and antibacterial activity or antiparasite and so on. So this is the origin. And if you think about digestion and the, the gut story starts with the salivary gland. We start to digest with the salivary gland. And the salivary gland is the origin of venom, of, of, of a venom gland, which is part of the salivary gland. So from the snake, from the snake point of view, the story starts with a digestive antibacterial PLA2 that evolves as a toxin. That's the evolution, to make it very simple. Then, then the question is the pancreatic and the 2A PLA2. But as you know, depending on the, on the snake species, in the, in the venom gland, you have either 1B, like cobra, 1A, 1B, you know the details, or in the, in the evolved snakes, uh, the, the, like the, the crotoxin, 
this is a group 2A PLA2, not a 1B. So, so some snakes use the 1B scaffold, but this is really a details for experts like you and me. For, for the rest of the group, 1B, 2A, they just don't care. Um, so this is just to try to answer the evolution point of view. So now about the, the inhibitor game. Yes, Lily, Lily was doing a very good job, as I said uh, initially, because in that days, they didn't know that we have 10 PLA2 in human. They just didn't know before we cloned it uh, with, with some other people from Shonogi as well in competition with these guys. But in the early days when Lily started, they, we knew two PLA2s, 1B and 2A. And indeed the idea was to inhibit 2A, which is the inflammatory PLA2, and not 1B, which was supposed to be a very kind of housekeeping PLA2, only playing a role in digestion. But this was too simplistic because today we show that 1B might be a molecule playing a role in T-cell energy, T-cell energy, which is far away from digestion. And hello, hello, the dog. Nice to see you. Uh, I know. Uh, it's good. We can't uh, control them, can we? <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so so the pancreatic PLA2, just to make a long story short, in 86, 86, remember, this is a long time ago, the 1B was cloned from human lung, lung, not the gut, which was a kind of uh, first uh, indication that the 1B is not only a digestive enzyme, it's making more than that. So this was a warning message to say, oh, ho, be careful. The aspirators are making different things in the lung, in the gut, and so on. So this was kind of highlighting the complexity of the story. And of course, nowadays we have many PLA tools and it turns out that the virus pladib is a kind of pan inhibitor, of course, with different affinities, with a, a range of affinities depending on the PLA tools. I like to remind you that virus pladib does not inhibit at all. We published this 20 years ago. Virus pladib does not inhibit the group 12A or the group 12B PLA2, nor it inhibits the group 3 PLA2, which are orphan. These PLA2s, we have no inhibitors against these inhibitors, in, in, these PLA2s, because they are, they are different in structure in comparison with the classical 1B or 2A. Uh, sorry, long okay. way, but you had, a, you had a long question, Ed, so I had We a long should probably time. move on. I know, I know. Yeah. Well, that's, that's been a great <laughs> session of questions there. So, so, the, thank you for the, re the okay. responses, Gerard. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So, thank, you, um, Ed. thank you, Ed. We, we can continue the discussion later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fascinating discussion. So um, I've got a question about inhibitors. You know, there's a lot of work to develop inhibitors for these enzymes. Has anyone tried developing inhibitors for non-canonical roles like non-enzymatic activity? Because you, you mentioned, but you didn't talk in any detail about the other roles of these proteins that are not related to their enzymatic activity. Has any of this been a target for clinical development? Not yet, as far as I know, except the antibodies. But uh, this is so, so most people are targeting the active site with the small molecule inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And this is 99% uh, of the paper. And uh, the idea to target uh, an over region of the PLA2 uh, and, uh, and just to use antibodies, for instance, this, I would say surface inhibitor uh, enzyme, this is brand new. And this is what mm. I call collectively the second generation inhibitor. Mm. Uh, but there's no, not, no nothing, I would say, basically. No, because if, the, if these roles are clinically important, then they must be worth yes. going after to try and block. Yes. I mean, it brings yes. me back to the point about the um the PLA2 or one that you said was highly enriched in kidney or one or two, whichever, sorry, the highly enriched in kidney. And you said that it binds the, the SPLA2, but it doesn't seem to signal. So it, is it just some kind of like docking site on podocytes that's present? And if so, is it bound up with SPLA2 all the time in the kidney? I, I just don't know. I mean, the, it, it might be that the receptor in our podocyte is playing a role that has nothing to do with the PLA2. Mm. Uh, I mean, if we think simple, uh, the receptor is in the podocyte facing the blood, facing the blood, okay? And we know in the blood, in our blood, we have uh, we have the group 2A PLA2, which mm. is just in the healthy in the healthy donor, the PLA2 is there. Of course, the PLA2 concentration increases in, in inflammation like sepsis, but this PLA2, human group 2A, does not point to human PLA2R. We mm. published this 25 years ago. 
So it do, in our hands, it does not bind. In vivo, okay, who knows? But uh, in vitro, in the, the best we can do, uh, it does not bind. The okay. human one b the pancreatic PLA2, which is also in the blood, it does not bind either to the to the human PLA2. And this is true in human, but this is not true in the mice. Okay, so so this is actually touching another point, which is very important. The warning message is this one: uh, what we learn about the function of PLA2 in mouse studies, and Marco, if he's around, Marco Mirakami, he knows this. Uh, what we we know about the function of PLA2 in the mice, which is important, may not be true in human. And in plus, because of the of the knockout. Uh, of the group 2A, as I said before, which is an overlayer in, in the complexity. So the translational experiment from the mice to human, we have to be very careful. Mm. That's the end point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. And, well, and, and, just, and just Valerie, to complete what you asked about the, the inhibitor on the surface, mm. we have to remember that the snake is giving us an over-example. The snake has very toxic PLA2 in the mouth in the venom, okay, in the venom gland. So the snake is eating its, its, its own venom, PLA2. Mm. The snake has developed mechanism to prevent toxicity. And mm -hmm. there's a huge amount, look at this, there's a huge amount of super high affinity inhibitor in the blood of snake yeah. from the same snake, which inhibit the, the, yeah. the own venom PLA2 of the, the snake. But the snake are fighting together. One snake is fighting with another from another species. And the inhibitor is super specific. So the snake can eat another snake because the other snake don't have the inhibitor to protect himself. There's a war between snakes. That's a crazy story. Okay? How does so, that work? I mean, how, it's just how does amazing. That yeah. There are that... many papers. I can spend a seminar on this if you want, but uh, but but this is a crazy story, okay? And yeah. we have to learn about. It. Yeah. We have to learn picomolar affinities, okay? These antibody these inhibitors are just like the antibodies we dream to have. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. That's really amazing. And they they are similar to PLA two R receptor. They, they belong to the same family, mm. the lectin family. Some of them at least. Mm. <laughs> Do you want to finish by asking Karthi uh, Muratasamy's yes. question if you have an answer to it? Yes. So this is a very important question, actually. Okay. Uh, because there's, there's a, from food sources, and I will include microbiota. And it could be possible that within the microbiota, we have natural inhibitors for PLA2s. Uh, it, it, it could be that some uh, lipid, modified lipid are inhibitors of pla So So this is uh, in between the natural inhibitors and the exogenous but natural inhibitors around. Yes, it is possible, I would say, to make it simple. Uh, okay. Okay. And okay, that's great. So while that question was being answered, another final one did come in from Johannes Berger. So let's take that one. Yes, I, I would Hello. be here. Hi. Yeah. Great. Uh, Go for it. I, I, I'm from <laughs> Vienna. I would just like to know your opinion on the importance of the substrate specificity of the different uh, subtypes. So for example, in particular for eta phospholipid uh, selective uh, phospholipase A2. Yeah, this is, this is uh, the, the, the one second answer is every PLA2 has a different specificity and, and the specific activity, the level of specific activity can vary by a million fold for some PLA2s, a million fold, which means that, the, the, for example, the group 2A PLA2, the human group 2A, has a million fold higher activity on pure PG liposomes in comparison with pure PC, a million fold. That's why this PLA2 is inactive when you add the enzyme on the, on the, on the resting cell. That's why this PLA2 in your, in your tears can kill the bacteria but it's not harmful to your corneal cell secreting the PLA2. So this PLA2 prefers uh, PG over PC, phosphatidylglycerol over PC by a million fold. This was published by my Gelb and many others, okay? Long time ago. So this is just an example to say, 
that the specificity vary, varies enormously for one PLA2, depending on the substrate. And, the, and that's why it's very difficult to say this PLA2 is super active and this one is not active. It really depends on the substrate you use in your assay. And Ed Dennis knows this very well, did many, many papers on that also. Uh, but, but then there are some PLA2s, whatever is the substrate we use, they have very low enzymatic activity. The best example I have for this is the group 12A PLA2. We don't know what is the physiological substrate of that PLA2. But, but it turns out that this PLA2 on whatever substrate we try, there's no, there's no high enzymatic activity. And then we have the 12B PLA2, which has a mutation in the active site and a natural mutation in the active site. And this PLA2 has zero activity. And we have the same in snake venom. There are PLA2s like protein in snake venom without enzymatic activity because of a mutation in the active site or around the active site. And they are toxic. They can be myotoxic, suggesting that we don't need PLA2 activity to have a function, a pharmacological effect. Yeah, but it does my, my, mm -hmm. my, my question you, would more have dealt uh, to the signaling cascade releasing arachidonic acid or DHA from the SN2 position uh, in the brain, for example. Uh, yeah. And there, maybe they, they do differ between eta phospholipids and eta phospholipids. So, so, therefore, I thought more what's your thought on th in this yes. okay. regard. Yes, I, this is a very important question. And here, I want to, to make a warning message again. Uh, to me, you have to consider, just think about the concept. Uh, when you add a PLE2 on cells and you look at DHA release or whatever uh, lipid mediator release, you have to ask to yourself, is it my SPLE2 that I add to the cell that is doing the job? Or is it possible that this PLA2 activate one intracellular PLA2s, including CPLA2 or IPLA2 or another lipase, another thing? So in that mechanism, you crosstalk, you have a crosstalk, a trans signaling between the SPLA2 outside of the cell and the CPLA2 or the IPLA2 inside the cell. And in fact, it's not the SPLA2 doing the job. It's not the SPLA2 which is specific for the DHA phospholipid. The SPLA2 do something by whatever mechanism on the surface of the cell, and it activates the CPLA2 which is doing the job. So you have to consider that the SPLA2 activate another PLA2 who is the guy doing the DHA release, for instance, in the brain. And this is true also when you have a phenotype in mice in the wall mice. When you knock down the PLA2 and you look at the lipidomics and you have a difference in the lipidomics, you cannot warranty, you, you cannot say the SPLA2 is doing the job by itself. It might be the SPLA2 is activating CPLA2 in vivo and the CPLA2 is doing the job. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, so, yes. So you, you need to think about the layers. The, like, and it's true for cytokines, just think about that. If you, add, if you inject a cytokine, you will activate the CPLA2 doing lipid mediator. And if you use the knockout for TNF, you will have the same kind of phenotype. So, so it's not mandatory that the SPLA2 is doing the job. It might be a ligand for receptor that activates CPLA2. Time, Ed, are you making a point that's related to the last point? If you are, I'll let you come in there. Yes. Uh, Gerard's description was very uh, excellent about to answer that question, and it brought, made me go back to think about snake venoms. So uh, many believe that when a snake injects its venom in a prey, not humans particularly, but be the same thing, it's the PLA2 is extremely active at hydrolyzing the membranes. The lytic and neurotoxic factors in cobras and in rattlesnakes are the things that cause the major harm. But without the PLA2, they don't get into the cells to do it. So the PLA2 is the excess, in that case, the SPLA2 is the accessory to allow a toxin 
to get at its target. Very analogous to what Gerard just said uh, in response to that question and why it's so difficult to interpret specificity and at the cellular levels. Um, there is a very specific comparison of the ether lipids with the plasmalogen lipids, with the acyl lipids for a number of these pure enzymes in vitro uh, in BBA a couple of years ago that answers that question for a few specific PLA2s on the, the direct comparison of what an ether does versus an acyl group, but very hard to answer that in an in vivo setting of cells, as Gerard explained. Okay. There's one other question. Are there any functional risk gene variants of SPLA2 reported from any particular cohorts, for example, GWAS studies or whatever? I would, I would say there might be 10 to 20 papers uh, showing SNP polymorphism or GWAS analysis uh, connecting the PLA2 with many inflammatory diseases uh, and infection as well. Uh, there's one paper in malaria, there's one paper, more, many papers in cardiovascular diseases and so on. So I think this is the short answer. Yeah, yeah. So search them on PubMed and they should yeah, come they up are. Just easily. PubMed. Yeah, yeah. Just PubMed. Right. 20 papers, I think 20 right. or more. And if you, if you can't find them, get in touch with Gerard by email and I'm yeah, sure he'll answer you answer. Yeah, yeah. Answer. Okay, well, uh, that was great. That's probably the longest webinar we've ever had. Great discussion. Uh, sorry, the I'm the wrong guy. Probably. No, no, I think that's great. Oh. That's absolutely great. Thank you very much. Like and th thanks very much, everybody. Have a great evening. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you, Gerard. Thank, thank you very much, Valérie and, and Lauren. And thank you, everybody, for listening.